Fantastic. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, absolutely is, and I'm I'm very impressed with the with the turnout. Very happy. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, just before we begin, um, I'd like to say a few thank yous. Firstly, a big thank you to Kenny Brands, who I can see Kenny really spearheaded this project from behind. Really planted the um, the idea. We had a phone call a couple of months ago now, and that's really where where the idea for this mini series came about. So thank you, Kenny. Also, a very big thank you to Portnoy, who has been behind the scenes as well really ensure it, you know, facilitating this from the Shores perspective and promoting it and really driving it forward. And also thank you to Rob Ginsbury as well for giving it the go ahead. Um, just a couple of words to introduce this mini series. We've called it Three Shurim for three weeks and it really is just that. So this week you're stuck with me. Next week we have a special guest all the way from America, Dan Coleman, originally from Hendon and currently in Hendon as well um, on his break from Yeshiva. And that's something to look forward to. He's spoken in the show before and is very, very talented. And the week after that, you will be back with me. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, can I just have some thumbs up to, to, to assure me that you can, in fact, see the screen? Thumbs up. Brilliant. OK, so you, you can see on the screen that the title of today's share is Ahava Shisrael, Loving the Jewish people, the key for redemption. And I've set out a roadmap at the top. I'm gonna to quickly gloss over it. And the idea of the roadmap is just to ensure that as we go through the shear, you'll sort of know where we're heading and hopefully that will make it easier to follow. So there are seven different points. The first point is we're gonna begin with Masachas Yuma, with Tractate Yuma, which will outline why the Batei Mikdash, why the temples were in fact destroyed. Then, Point two, we're going to delve very briefly into some of the com commentaries, um, specifically a commentator called the Morome Hasada, um, and we're going, to we're going to raise relevant questions. Third, we're going to deep dive into exactly what Sinas Chinam, baseless hatred, actually is, and you'll see that Sinas Chinam will in fact be the reason given by the Gemara as to why the second Beis HaMikdash, the second temple, was destroyed. Um, and then fourth, we're going to um, look at the Gemara again through the lens of the Maharal's explanation, and hopefully that will shed light onto, um, onto the Gemara. Uh, fifth, we're going to extend that idea. Um, we're going to say it's not only the case that the Beis Amikdash was destroyed um, as a result of Sinas Finam and therefore can only be re rebuilt with its antidote, Ahavash Yisrael, but the entire Gula, the entire redemption, is actually predicated on us building Ahavash Yisrael, um, a love of every Jew within ourselves. Then six is actually going to be the main part of the shir, which is going to be developing a few different approaches um, as to how we can generate Ahavash Yisrael within ourselves. And seven is a very short idea on the parasha, just a snippet, something for everyone to be able to take away about share over the, um, over the Shabbos table. And the idea is very much in line with the notion of Ahavash Yisrael. So without further ado, um, well, just one point. If anyone has questions, um, I'm happy just to, you know, have you call out. That's completely fine. Um, okay. And with that, let's jump into things. So introduction, points one to two on the roadmap. So we're going to look at the Gemara itself and some of the commentaries. Fine. So structurally, um, I have the Aramaic over here and we have translation as well, courtesy of Safaria. Um, I have got translations for almost everything, either from Safaria or my own translations. Um, and you'll see there are a couple of things which weren't translated, but hopefully they should be self-explanatory with my reading it, hopefully. Okay, so let's jump into things. Source one. Mikdash Rishon, Mibnei Macharov. The first base on Mikdash, the first temple, why was it destroyed? Mibnei Shlosha Devarim Shahayubo. On account of three things, Existed in that generation, Avo Dazara, Begilui Arias, Beshvikas Damim, idolatry, um, immoral, promiscuous behavior, and, and murder, bloodshed. Mikdash Sheni, the second temple, Shahayu Oskin Batora, of the mitzvahs of Gemilas Vasadim, Bibne Macharov, the second temple in which the people of the generation were immersed in Torah. They performed mitzvahs and acts of kindness. Why was that destroyed? 
because there was sinas chenam, because there was baseless hatred. Continuing, Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Elazar, the Amit Harvayhu, we have Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Elazar, both of them said, Rishonim shenizgala avonam, nizgala kitzam. The people in the first generation, the generation of the first temple, whose sin was revealed to say what the sin which they'd done was open to everyone, it was clear. So Nisgala Kitsam, the Gemara tells us that seeing as their sin was revealed and clear, their end, namely the end of the exile associated, which resulted from, the, from their sins, was also revealed. And we'll see what that means in, in just a moment. However, those in the second generation, the generation of the second base of Mikdash, whose sin was not open, it wasn't so clear cut, lo nisgala kitsam. The end to their exile was not revealed. And we'll see what that means in just a moment. So let's jump into Rashi. And then I'd like to jump almost immediately into the Morome Sada. So Rashi says, what shin nisgala avonam? Just over here, highlight it now. What shin nisgala avonam? The sins of those during the time of the first base of Mikdash were, were revealed. Lo They didn't conceal their sins. To say it was open to everyone, it was clear to all what, what they'd been doing, namely the, the three cardinal sins. And as a result of that, Rashi continues, Nisgala Kitsam, Lefi Meleos Labavel, Shivim Shana Efbedeschem. So Rashi's citing a Pasuk from Yermia, which says that they were in exile for 70 years. And indeed, we know that the exile which ensued as a result of the sin of those who lived during the times of the first base of Migdash was for 70 years, after which the second temple, the second base of Migdash was rebuilt. However, those who lived during the time of the second base of Migdash, their sin was not revealed. And Rashi tells us, Rashi tells us that those who lived during the time of the second base of Migdash, they were Rashaim, they were wicked doers. However, they conducted these wicked acts, Besater, in a concealed manner. And to follow up in the Gemara, since their sins were Besater, done in a concealed way, the end to that exile will also be concealed from us. And indeed, we know that Ad Hayamazah, even to this very day, to 2021, um, and I think during COVID as well, we can begin to appreciate this this gullers, this feel of, feeling of being in exile. Until today, we are still in that very exile, which ensued following the sin of sinas chinam, of baseless hatred. A couple of points from a commentator, the Marome Sada, and this was a work authored by the Natsiv, Rav Natali Tzvi Berlin, who was the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Spolodjan in, in the 1800s. And he says as follows, he quotes, um, so just, I'm, I'm reading from here, and if you'd like to follow in the English, I have some English written up over here. So just reading the, the Hebrew, he tells us, But Tosefta Shilhi Menachas, Shahayu Irvin Esanaman Yotin Medai. The Natsid tells us, what was the reason the second base of Migdash was destroyed? He cites to Tosefta at the end of Gemara Menachas, he says, because the people in that generation, they loved money excessively. They had monetary lust. He continues, And the Gemara also includes this monetary lust within the sin, within the framework of sinas chinam. And this is the, the crucial line, which I'd like to focus on. Because this excessive monetary lust caused the sinas chinam the baseless hatred to be amongst them. And at this point, I'd like to ask a question. The question is very simple. What's the association with, um, between sinas chenam, baseless hatred, and monetary lust, to the extent that the Natsir says that the monetary lust actually drove them towards the sinas chenam? So I, this is my translation below. But I, I think it's accurate, so I'm just trans, just highlighting it for you, because this monetary lust caused sinas chinam to be between them, caused it, and that, that those are the words garam actually caused it. So how how do we understand this? How do we understand that the monetary lust actually caused it, drove and generated the sinas chinam between the people in that generation? And we'll return to this point later on. Let's bear that in mind. 
Um, the next point in the Muremi Hasada, the Natsiv says, Rishonim Shiniskala Avonam, Niskala Kitsam, he says, those who lived in the first generation, um, their sin was revealed, and, and therefore the end to their exile was also revealed. The Natsiv says, Nira Lafaresh, it seems that we can explain, Shiyadu Bumashachatu Mechamas Vishas, the people in that generation, they knew the sin which they'd done, and they knew that they'd done those sins on account of their riches, on account of their malice. But al kain ka shehegir onsham shabala kadosh baruch min iskala kitzam. And therefore, when their sin, um, when the punishment came about, ha kadosh baruch revealed their end. And this is in contrast to, and this is really the focus. This is in contrast to those in the second generation. Masha ein kain b'bay sheni, which isn't the case for those who lived during the time of the second temple. Lo niskala avonam shelo yadu machatasam. Why is it, why was it that, um, the, sorry, we say that the sin wasn't revealed because they didn't know what they'd done. They didn't actually know that they'd sinned. Because in truth, they were Yerushalayim, they feared Hashem, and they were, they were observant. You know, on the surface, we'd say that they were very from Jews in today's parlance, but they didn't focus on the truth. And that's the reason why the end to their galas, the end to their exile, wasn't revealed. Because sinas chinam still existed in the land. Now, this is a startling line. This final line from the Mutiv is startling. He says, it wasn't just the case that they didn't know what they had done. They didn't know that they had been over, that they had transgressed sinas chinam. In fact, they were still steeped, they were still submerged in Sinas Chinam. And it's interesting to note that there's no reason for us to surmise that we, in the 21st century, aren't still submerged within this sin of Sinas Chinam. And we'll develop this idea going forward. Um, but what, we, what I'd like to take away from these sources is point number one, we see that the second Beis HaMikdash was destroyed on account of Sinas Chinam, Beis hatred. And we can also see that Sinas Chinam isn't so clear-cut. It's Beseter. It's in a concealed manner. We can't necessarily, you know, there may be people who on the surface seem to be fully observant, um, you know, doing everything right, but they may harbour these negative feelings which we associate with Sinas Chinam. So this is something which we really have to delve into and prize out what exactly defines Sinas Chinam. So with that in mind, I'd like to begin defining Sinas Chinam. And I'm going to do this in a backwards way. So what is Sinas Chinam? This is point three on the roadmap. Um, like I said, I'm going to do this backwards. We know that the opposite of Sinah is Ahava. We generally translate Ahava as love. But let's delve into the Rambam, seemingly a disconnected Rambam, to see how the Rambam understands Ahava. This is a Rambam. From Hilcha Seshava, Perik Yurt Halacha Gimel, and we have a translation courtesy of Safaria. So feel free to follow along in the translation if you prefer. Rambam asks, How do we love Hashem? And he describes the love which we ought to feel towards Hashem. He says, Hashem. And what is the love which is fitting for us to love Hashem with? Ava Gadola, Yesera, Azama Od, a great love. A forceful love, to the extent that one finds his soul is bound in the love of Hashem. And he finds that he's thinking about Hashem the whole time. As if he's experiencing a love sickness. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And he compares this to the love which one may feel towards his wife, in which one's mind never frees up from that sensation of love, that sensation of attachment, which he feels towards that lady. Indeed, he thinks about her constantly. Whether he's sitting, whether he's standing, whether he's eating or whether he's drinking, that feeling of love is perennial. And he says, the love which one feels towards a woman, that's case number one. 
but the love which one feels towards Hashem is even greater. He says, Shoigim Baltomid, one thinks about HaKadosh Baruch Hu constantly. This is infatuation. As HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us in the Torah, we see in Shema, that we are commanded to love Hashem with all of our hearts and all of our souls. And this is what Shlomo tells us, the Derech Moshe was an allegory, that the love which we ought to feel towards Hashem is lovesickness. And all of Shir Hashirim, all of Megillah Shir Hashirim is a Moshe, an allegory for this. Let's revert to this term, Choylas Ava. What does it mean? So when thinking about this, I was reminded of a nursery rhyme that we used to sing as kids. And I think some of you will probably be familiar with it, hopefully. Um, but it, it went something like this, and I'm paraphrasing slightly. Um, we used to say, so-and-so, I love you. So-and-so, I love you. And when I'm without you, I'm blue. Blue, meaning ill. What's the idea? When someone feels a deep sense of love, a deep sense of infatuation and closeness with someone else, when they're apart from that person, they feel not just emotionally, but physically ill. It pains them. And um, it's interesting to note that when we think about, you know, certain circumstantial occurrences within, within our own lives, which drive negative feelings and, you know, sometimes depressive states, th those things are not necessarily, you know, just financial woes, but, but ultimately they're driven by a sense of absence. Something was there, something, someone who we felt close to was there, and now they're suddenly gone. We feel distant from them. Um, and this is Choyla Sa'ava. It, it's a sense of feeling intensely close, an intense kirava, an intense closeness to someone or, or even to our Kaddish Baruch Hu, and, um, and trying to channel those emotions. So if we have to summarize this Rambam in one line, how does the Rambam define closeness? Ava is defined as a kirava, an intense how does he define Ahava? Rather, it's defined as an intense closeness. And seeing as Sinna is the opposite to Ava, Sinna can be defined as, as Richuk, as distance. Now, this is revolutionary because, if I'm honest, up until a couple of years ago, I understood Sinna on quite a superficial level. Sinna was baseless hatred, malice, animosity. Hatred is a strong word. But the Rambam tells us that it's not true. Sinna is much simpler. Sinna is apathy. It's distance, feeling aloof. It's seeing someone else and feeling nothing towards them, feeling a distance, not feeling that closeness. And with that in mind, we can begin to understand the Gemara. And to do so, I'd like to draw on the Maharal in Prague. And I see Bubba, and Bubba knows why, but I'm thinking of Bubba as I'm, as I'm reading this. So the Maharal in Prague says the following. In a safe and Netzach Israel. I haven't translated this, uh, so I'm going to read it and translate as I go. He says, Sinas Chinam Ashehu Hachilat Vahapirud. What is Sinas Chinam? What is baseless hatred? Baseless hatred is, in fact, division and fragmentation. It's feeling far, it's feeling divided from other people, lacking that sense of closeness, which is in line with our conclusion based on the Rambam. And he says as follows, and I'm actually just going to summarize the first bit and then read the translated bit. He says, why is it that the Mikdash Rishon, the first base of Mikdash was there? Why were we Zoycha? Why did we merit it? And he says it was on account of the Zuchus Gimel Abbas Hakadoshin, on account of the merit of our three forefathers. And he says, um, the three reasons, um, um, the three reasons why the first base of Mikdash was destroyed actually corresponded to the three merits um, which drove the initial construction of the base of Mikdash. Why so? We said, the Maharal told us, that the first base of Mikdash was there on account of the three others. He tells us that Avraham, Avraham was exceptionally, um, exceptionally morally upstanding. In fact, the Torah tells us, I'm just going to quote this one line, tells us about Sarah. The Torah tells us that suddenly, all of a sudden, when Avraham and his wife Sarah went to a foreign land and Sarah lay at risk of being taken by the king of that land, 
that suddenly Avraham recognized that his wife was beautiful. And why was this? So the commentaries tell us, because he hadn't looked at her all of his days. Avraham was a pillar of morality. Yitzchak. Yitzchak stood for Harachaka Me'avodazara. He distanced himself from Avodazara from idolatry. How do we see this? Because he was willing to offer himself up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, as opposed to all other gods. Yaakov. Yaakov stood against Shvichas Damim. He countered Lachet. How do we know this? We say that Yaakov who Achayim, Yaakov was the pillar of life. Shahar Yaakov in Lais. The Gemara in Tanis, and Masachat Tanis, tells us that Yaakov Avinu never died. Without going into the nuances of that Gemara, we see that Yaakov stood for life. And in that way, we can understand why the first base of Middash was destroyed as a result of the three cardinal sins. Because why was it there in the first place? As a result of the three others. We have Avraham. Avraham signifies morality. He didn't even take in the beauty of his wife. And that's why, um, that's why the Gidui Arias was there and it countered, the, the immorality countered um, Avraham. Secondly, we have Yitzchak. Yitzchak stood for countering Avodah Zarah. And that's why when they, the people in the generation of the first base of Mikdash, were over Avodah Zarah, they countered the zechus, the merit of Yitzchak. And finally, we have Yaakov, who stood for life. As the Gemara says, he never died. And that's why Shvichas Damim, the sin of bloodshed, countered the zechus, the merit of Yaakov. The second base of Mikdash, why was it there? Why are we Zohar? And this I'd like to read inside. This is the, the underlying lines. We say a base base megdasheni shlo hayukach kokach bamala hayuneged kaneshi susa atzmam. Why we zocha? Why did we merit to the construction of the second base of megdash? Because it, it was on account of the Jewish people themselves. There was no zechus. There was no merit of our forefathers. It was on our account. We deserved it. A kavar amru chazal and our sages tell us in Shabbos ki they tell us that after the first base of Mikdash was destroyed, the Zechus Abbas, the merit of our forefathers, ended. And that's the reason why we were unable to rely on it to generate the second base of Mikdash. And that's why we had to be Zechus to it ourselves. And that's why the first base, the second base of Mikdash, rather, only came about as a result of us. And this is the crucial line. And therefore, the sin of Sinas Chinam, which he's destroyed as Chiluk and Pirud, as distance, fragmentation from one another, not feeling part of the collective, that was Mavatel, that cancelled the very reason why we had been Zohar, why we had merited the construction of the base of Mikdash, namely on account of ourselves, our collective unit. Why is it that we were called Knesset Yisrael, this, the, the gathering of Israel? Because we were connected, we were achters, we were a single collective unit. And this explains the Maharal, is the reason why the second base of Mikdash was destroyed solely on account of Sinas Chinam. Okay, so let's extend this and then we'll do a bit of a summary before we go into how we can generate Avash Yisrael. We've seen so far that Sinas Chinam was the reason why the second base of Mikdash was destroyed. And indeed, based on the Nutziv, we can see that this is the reason why we are still in that same Gullus, that still exile, that's that same exile, even today. But how do, can we extend that to, um, to, I mean, we see that in reference to the base of Mikdash, but can we extend that to the, the entire exile in general? And we can see based on a Medrash that, that we can. This is a Medrash from the Tzavim. Uh, and the Medrash tells us, I'm reading from here. And if you'd like to read the translation, um, you can read from here. So we see, he said, the Medrash tells us that we find that all of Yisrael, the Jewish people, will not be redeemed until we become an Aguda Achas, a single band and a single people. Shenema, as we see in Yermia, in those days of Eishahi, and in that time, Hashem, 
Hashem will speak. That's when Bnei Yisrael, the Jewish people, will come together. Only they are open, only when they are connected, a single collective, only then can they be makaba, the Pnei Shechina, can they merit to receive and greet the divine presence. And just skipping down to the next source, which is this very same Pasuk in Yermia, I'm just going to read the, the English. In those days and at that time, declares the Lord, the people of Israel together with the people of Judah shall come and they shall weep as they go to seek the Lord their God. Um, and okay, it's actually the next, actually the next pasuk. But we can see from this pasuk that it's exclusively when there are single people that they will merit the gula shalema, the the redemption. So let's take this back. Let's do a little bit of a summary. And I think for this we'll go back to the roadmap. We've seen the Gemara and Yuma. The Gemara and Yuma tells us the first base of Mikdash was destroyed on account of the three sins, namely Gilu Arias, immorality, Avodah Zarah idolatry and shvichas dam and bloodshed. We saw, however, that the second base of Mikdash was destroyed on account of sinas chinam, baseless hatred. And indeed, we, see, we saw, based on the commentaries, that this still exists even today. We surmise from the Rambam that seeing as Ava is defined as an intense feeling of closeness, almost an infatuation, it follows that sinna, sinna is... Um, is richuk, is distance, apathy, not feeling a connection with our fellow Jews. And we corroborated this with the Maharal, who tells us that it's chiluk or period, it's division and, and fragmentation. And the Maharal explains this is the reason for the Gemara, because the second base Amikdash only came about on account of the Zuchas Atzma, on account of us, Knesset Yisrael, our unity. In which case it stands to reason when that, when that unity was broken, the justification, the very basis upon which the second base of Mikdash was built, was removed. It went. And that's the reason why it was destroyed. And we also saw from the Medrash and the Pasuk in Yirmiyah that not only will the base of Mikdash only be, re be rebuilt when we rid ourselves of Sinas Chinam and generate this Avas Yisrael, but that's true for the entire Gurla, for the entire redemption. So with that in mind, we should feel very motivated. We have to try and generate this Ava Shisar, and in so doing, the Ezra Sashem, the Kar of Mamash, bring back the Geula, bring the Geula. So how do we do this? So this is really the final half of the Shir, and we'll see how much of it we get through. The truth is, some of the ideas are actually quite complex, um, and so we'll have to see how we do with them. Okay. So I have three different approaches as to how we can generate Ava Shisrael. The first approach is split into three layers. Okay, so approach one, part one, really an introduction, the inner soul. I'd like to begin with a mushal. This is a mushal brought by Rav Meir Twersky Shlita of Yeshiva University. Um, and, and I'll say the mushal and then we'll explain where, where we go with it. Rav, Marshall, Rav, Rav Meir Twersky paints a picture. Let's imagine a young child. The young child is beautiful, pure, naive, not just internally, but externally too. You know, let's, you can imagine, um, you know, the catalogs you see for Next Kids or Gap Kids, all of these, uh, you know, the clothes brochures, brochures and uh, the, you know, the beautiful children they have. Let's imagine a child like that. Time progresses and the child falls by the wayside. The child struggles and eventually, you know, they start experimenting, falling in with the wrong crowds. They may begin abusing certain substances and eventually become a criminal. They may even be imprisoned. Now, someone who sees this adult today, they see vicious, they see malice, they see, um, you know, someone who's, who's um, a drain on society. However, the parents, of this child, and indeed, even people who grew up with this child, they'll still have the image of the naivety, the purity, the tahara of the child from when they were young. It's interesting to note that the parental instinct notwithstanding, the, the parents feel a sense of positive positivity towards the child because they recognize that the tahara is still there. They recognize 
that, okay, this child has struggled, but ultimately those struggles and the crimes are external to the child's core identity. From their perspective, from their vantage point, the child's core identity, the core essence of the child, is that Tara, that purity, which they saw when the child was young. That's the marshal, that's the allegory. And Rabbeir Tversky tells us that the nimshal, the underlying message, is that the Tara, the purity which the parents, and indeed those who grew up with the child see, is really, is really um, reminiscent of the child's soul, the child's neshama. To say they can see the neshama, they can feel the neshama, they see that everything else which the child's gone through and everything which the child has now become is external to the child's core identity. The child's core identity is his neshama. Now, how does this help us? How can this help us generate a sense of Ava saw? Because we can see people, we can see other Jewish people. And even if on the surface, they may not appear to be so great, we can begin, if we can work on ourselves, to see the Tara and indeed to see the Neshamas within each of them. But we have to ask ourselves, this is all very well when it's our child or when it's someone who we grew up with, someone who we saw and we can recognize the Tara that what once was. But how about when it's not our child or someone who we didn't know growing up? How do we generate it? So with this in mind, I'd like to venture to the second layer of this first approach interconnected souls. Now this is very deep, and this is actually based on the works of Chabad Hasidus, specifically the first Rebbe of Chabad, um, Rav Shneir Zalman of Liadi, and also the third Rebbe of Chabad, the Tanakh Tzedek, the first Rebbe Menachem Mendel Shneerson. And I think we'll begin by just speaking it out, and then we'll read the Tanya and dip into the Jerusalem Talmud as well, the Yerushalmi. In the Tanya, Rav Shneir Zaman of Liati, the first Rebbe of Chabad, tells us that all of our souls are intimately connected. In fact, and this is very deep, and I, I don't, I don't um, intend to go. I don't know how much I understand it myself, but quoting some Kabbalistic sources, the, the Ulta Rebbe, the first Rebbe of Chabad, tells us that all of our souls in their initial state were actually part of a collective unit. They were part of a collective unit, namely the soul of Adam, the soul of Adam. To say that HaKadosh Baruch Hu initially only created a single soul, and that was the soul of Adam. And what happened was there was a certain hishtalshalus, which means the soul of Adam was taken downwards. It was split and divided into individual parts. And those are each of our souls today. And they went through this process, this process of concealment. But in short, all of our souls originate in that original soul of Adam. And indeed, the original soul of Adam was rooted in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in which case, all of our souls today, all of our Neshama Sakadoshas, our holy souls, are intimately connected to our Kaddish Baruch Hu. In fact, if we think about this with a mashal, let's take an apple. If we take a slice of an apple, the slice of the apple is identical to the rest of the apple. It just happens to be in a diff different physical location. And really it's similar when it comes to our souls today. All of our souls are in a certain sense, and this is very abstract, and I, like I said, I don't intend to go into it too much. All of our souls in a certain sense are actually a chalek, a portion of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They're a portion of that original apple, the apple of Hashem, if we can think about it like that. In the words of the Baal Hatanya, all of our souls are a chalek, elika, memaal, mamash. They're a portion of godliness. So with that in mind, we can begin to appreciate that all of our souls, my souls, the souls of everyone listening today and the souls of every single Jewish person are intimately connected, interconnected. They're part of one soul. So we have to ask ourselves, why are we different? 
if my soul is the is rooted in, in the same place as all of your souls, why are we different? And the answer is given to us by the Balhatanya. And with that, I'd like to begin reading. He says, Okay, if we can start from the translated section, and I'll translate as I go. I don't know translation for this bit. We say, He says, since all of our souls are compatible with one another, they all have a single father. Name Hashem. And that's the reason all of us are called Achim. This is based on a Pasuk. All of us are called brothers. Why is that? And this is for the reason we said, Mitzad, Shoresh Nafsham Bashem Echad. Because the root of all of our souls is in Hashem. This is the key we need. The Balatanya tells us why is it that we're different? We're different on a fact on account of our bodies. The only thing which distinguishes us are our bodies. Let's continue. Therefore, someone who makes their body the Ikka, the main focus of their life, and their nefesh, or their neshama, their soul, ancillary, secondary, it's impossible for there to be true love between them. Why is this? Let's flesh this out. And if anyone has thoughts, please feel free to share too. He tells us that if someone looks at the world through the lens of their guf, through the lens of their body, through the lens of superficiality, then, then, then they are in fact looking at the world through the lens of the very thing which separates them from other Jewish people. However, if they're able to repress the focus on their body and instead begin to look at the world through their neshama, then they will in fact be able to recognize, not just recognize on an intellectual level, but feel emotionally the connection which they have with every other Jew. Because they'll be able to recognize that their neshama is in fact rooted in the same place as the neshama as every other Jew. Um, before we read the next bit, I'd like to just put some notes of my own on this. Um, which I'm just going to read quickly. Um, if we're able to isolate our soul, the neshama within each of us, and rid it of its external trappings, namely superficiality, um, what we'd refer to as gashmias, then we have in effect extracted the segment within ourselves, which is compatible with the segments of everyone else, the neshamas of everyone else, the segments which can comprise this, it, this single collective soul of Adam. To say, if we're able to be mavatel, to cancel and nullify the focus on our egos and superficiality and attune ourselves to our souls, then we're able to facilitate a state of integrated unity of the souls. Now to further explain this, I'd like to look at this source over here. Now, this is from the Jerusalem Talmud from Masech at Darim, And we have a, a translation courtesy of uh, Savaria. So I'm going to read. Um, it tells us as follows. Heich avida hava makata koifas umacha sakina lidavi tachzara betim chiliate. So let's say someone was cutting meat and laid the knife on his hand. Would he in turn cut the other hand? What's this talking about? Let's say someone is shechting an animal with his right hand and accidentally he, um, he cuts his left hand. Would his left hand be angry with the right hand and smack the right hand? No, of course not, because the left hand recognizes that it's part of the same goof, the same body as the right hand. It's merely a different ava, a different limb, but it's part of a single collective unit. And this explains the actually the Temach Tzedek, the grandson of the first Rebbe of Chabad, this is an analogy for all of our souls, in that we are merely, our souls are merely different avarim, different limbs for a single guf. We have a single soul, and that soul was just divided through ge the generations and through numerous concealments. So with this in mind, we can begin to appreciate how intimately connected we are. 
And this is an extension to the first level, because let's recap. The first level with Rob Metwarski's analogy was telling us that every single person has an ashama. Every single Jew has an ashama. And with that, we can begin to appreciate the beauty of every single Jew. However, we said this is hard. You know, it's very hard to see the neshamas in everyone, especially those who we didn't know growing up. But now we can take it a step further. We can begin to appreciate that all of our neshamas are intimately connected. They all come from the same place and they're all rooted within HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Okay. With that in mind, let's take it to the third step, which is still within this first approach. What do we do when it's really tough? Let's say we see someone who is a no-gooder, a no-gooder. So the Rebbe tells us that we can employ the trait of Rachmanas, of compassion. Also, so the Rebbe tells us, he, he paints us a picture. He says, let's say we have someone who we actually hate. There's someone who do away with mitzvahs. There's someone who bring negativity into the world. They put other people down. How do we begin to love them? So he tells us as follows. He says, let's say someone does away with mitzvahs and even after being rebuked in the, in the correct way, they, they actively rebel in, in, with malice, with animosity. So he tells us as follows, and I'm reading from the translated bit here. He says, she mitzvah litzno sam, mitzvah l'avam. He says, for those people, there is in fact a mitzvah to hate them, and this is based on a Gomorrah. However, there is also a mitzvah to love them. And both of these traits, namely loving and hating, are true. Sinah mitzad harash The hatred is on account of the evil which is in them. We do have to detest that evil. However, va'ava mitzad bechinas hatov hagana shabahem. However, why do we love them? We love them on account of the goodness submerged, concealed within them. And what is this goodness? But it's the same point we said before. This goodness is the spark of godliness within them, which fuels their godly existence. And what is this nitzah tzalikis, this godly spark? This is their neshama hakadosha. And how do we do this? How do we love their neshama hakadosha, their goodness? And this is the third point. This is the point I like to focus on. The gamla oira rachamim belibayaleha. We have to arouse, inspire rachamim, compassion within our hearts for that goodness, for that nitzvah salikis, for their neshama. Hihiba bechinas galus, batochara, mesitra achara, agova aleha, varashatim. By rachmanas mavatelas a sinna ma eras, a ma eras haava. I'm going to say this outside. The Rebbe explains. That Rahmanas compassion is an incredibly powerful tool to arouse Ava. Let's take the situation. We have this person, this criminal, this no gooder, this person who puts others down. How can we begin to think about loving him? Because we recognize that he has an Asham Hagadosha. He has this holy spark, this, this soul which is rooted in godliness within him. And let's think about his soul. What's his soul going through? Let's begin to imagine the turmoil, the torture which his soul is undergoing. His soul is encased, enveloped within riches, within malice. This person is subjecting his soul to, to, to terrible things, to things which are anathema, to the very um, defining features of his soul. You know, if we take an example, let's say, let's say we move, we move from Hendon or Golders Green or Bournemouth or wherever we are, and, and we move from there to Madagascar. We feel completely out of our depth. We've left everything which is natural to us, everything which is compatible with, with our, our, um, our dispositions and, and our character traits. That's really what the, the soul of these people are going through. Their souls are immersed, submerged within this jungle of filth this jungle of, um, of riches, of malice. And when we begin to feel this, we look at these people who on the surface aren't doing so well and may suffer from certain things and put other people down, but we can begin to actually feel a sense of compassion for them because we look through them. We've rid ourselves of our superficiality and in so doing, we're able to identify their, their true essence, their neshama, and feel a compassion for their neshama, recognize that their neshama is suffering. And in so doing, we're able to be ma'ora, we're able to awaken a sense of love. 
So just to recap this first, this first approach, the first approach is firstly recognizing the neshama within every single Jew. Secondly, it's trying as much as we can to rid ourselves of superficiality, to recognize the only thing which divides us and other Jews are in fact our guf, our, our gufim, our gufos, our bodies. And in so doing, we're able, and, and through attuning ourselves with our neshamas, we're able to recognize how connected we are with others. And finally, when it's really, really tough, we're able to feel Rachmanus, generate compassion towards everyone else, and in so doing, a sense of love. So that's step, that's approach number one. Approach number two. Following this approach, we may think that our Kaddish Baruch Hu envisages almost a homogenous society in the sense that seeing as all of our neshamas are rooted in one thing, namely HaKadosh Baruch Hu, maybe it all meant to be the same, but this isn't true. In fact, HaKadosh Baruch Hu greatly values individuality. Okay. And to flesh this out, let's just take one Pasuk. And um, this is from Nitzavim. Um, it's actually based on the Medrash, which we saw earlier, which quoted Yirmiya, where we said that the Geula can only come when we are but a good achas, when we're a single band. And the Pasuk tells us that Tapchem Neshechem Begerecha Shebekerev Machanecha says your children, your wives, your converts who are amongst you, Mechotev Eitzecha Ad Shoev Mimecha, from the woodchoppers to the water drawers. And the idea really is that Kaddish Baruch doesn't envisage a homogenous society. There are going to be woodchoppers, there are going to be water drawers. Likewise, there are going to be people who subscribe to certain ideologies and others who subscribe to other ideologies. However, HaKadosh Baruch Hu values this. Not only does he value this, but we can actually use, use this as a tool to augment our sense of Avas Yisrael towards others. How so? So I don't have this on the page. But I'd like to tap into a shir which I heard from Rav Yitzchak Breitowitz Shlita, who's a Rav in Arasameh Yerushalayim. And he says as follows, and this is very relevant to Sefer Devarim, which we're finishing this week. He says, Chazal, our sages have different names for the five um, books of the Torah. And, sorry, Bamidbar. And he says, Bamidbar is called Sefer Habakudim, the book of the countings. And this is because there are numerous sentences or sensei in the books of Devarim, in the books of Bamidbar, rather. And he says that we can discern discrepancies between the nature of the sensei. How so? The first census took place just after Yom Kippur. Why? Because we know, Gamora tells us, that Yom Kippur was the day on which HaKadosh Baruch Hu forgave us for the Chet HaEgel, the sin of the golden calf, to say potential calamity dawned. However, Kadosh Baruch Hu had mercy, he had Rachamim, and after having that Rachamim, he wanted to count us. The second count took place just about seven, eight months later, Amosh Chodesh Iyar, the first of Iyar. And this was when we had Hakamas HaMishkan, the Mishkan was established. Now, what's the, what are the differences between these countings? So we can really see two differences. The first counting, namely that on, um, on, on Yom Kippur, was, was anonymous. To say everyone gave their half a shekel, but they didn't say who they were. And indeed, we don't even have a split up in the Torah of the amount of people um, who belong to each tribe. So, so it was anonymous and there was no tribal affiliation. The second counting, on the other hand, was far more individually focused. Firstly, we see that people were split by their tribes. The Torah tells us how many people who belong to Reuven, how many people who belong to Shimon. And not just that, the Torah actually tells us, and it's, it's really a Ramban, Nachmanides tells us, that all of the Jewish people would actually go to Moshe Rabbeinu. In fact, the Torah uses the following wording, and it says that when they conducted the counts, they would take mispar shemot, literally the number of their names. But the Ramban tells us that mispar is connected to the word mesaper, to tell. The idea being that all of the Jewish people would go to Moshe and they would tell, they would introduce themselves. So if we had to summarize the differences between the countings, we can say as follows. The first counting was number one, anonymous, and number two, collective. 
there was no focus on splits, on tribal affiliations. It was collective, the sum hold of Kleilusra. The second counting was tribal and in a certain sense, individually focused. Let's explain this further with two models, models of society. The first model is a homogenous society in which people are encouraged and sometimes even compelled, compelled to eradicate their uniqueness, their individualities, their idiosyncrasies in favor of the greater cultural goal. You know, we can think about say communist society where everyone is stripped down to their utilitarian function and, and really encouraged to, to be the same. The second model is multiculturalism. This is a society in which individuality is valued, a harmony of distinctive people. It's comprised of people of different flavors. The first society, I said this around the Shabbos table a few weeks ago, and we had someone whose parents were actually born in Germany. And, and this example resonated with him. So maybe, maybe it will resonate. It's an example of a Vitowitz to explain the first society, the homogenous society, in which people eradicate their idiosyncrasies in favor of the greater cultural goal. So the example is as follows. After calamity, let's take the most recent collective calamity of Klaliusol, which was the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, we, we saw that so many people were in the DP camps and, and they got married. They got married to each other. And when, when they got married to each other, often we find that these marriages were not necessarily marriages of intense love at the beginning, but they were often marriages of, of convenience in the sense that people recognized that there, there were certain similarities between them and the other person. They had certain common aims and they had to get married because they had to build towards the greater cultural goal, towards the continuance of the Jewish people. Um, so that, that's perhaps an example. That's a, a way in which we can understand this, this first model, the model of this greater anonymous and collective society. And Rob Weiswitz continues and he says as follows. He says the first counting, namely the counting after potential calamity, after Chet HaEgel, this was, um, this was a time of, of, uh, of building. This was a time when the Jewish people had almost been destroyed and they had to build something, build forwards. They had to build towards the cultural goal. And therefore the counting was nice. The second counting, however, was during Hakama Samishkan, the erection of the Mishkan. This, the Hakama Samishkan really reflected the permanent optimum status of, of the Jewish people. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told us that when you do this counting, you have to do through the lens of individuality. Everyone has to approach Moshe, introduce themselves. We're going to focus on the distinct, uh, the distinct um, identities of the tribes. So we can see that through the lens of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if we can say such, it seems from these countings that HaKadosh Baruch Hu greatly values individuality. People should not be encouraged to, res to repress their true identities and mold themselves into you know, a preconceived notion. Rather, they should express their individuality. And we see this time and time again throughout Tanakh and throughout as well. But just going back to going back to this reason, and then we'll jump onto the final approach. We can see from the Torah and we can see from this passage over here that individuality is to be valued. Admittedly, as we saw from the first approach, we are enmeshed. We are rooted in a single soul, or in a single place, which is Elikus and Akadosh Baruch Hu. However, we're all different as well. And when we recognize the differences between ourselves and others, and we go to value the individuality, which Akadosh Baruch Hu really demands of us, then we can build a greater tolerance, a greater sense of Avash Yisrael, and more generally, a greater sense of Achdus Yisrael. So this is perhaps a further tool which we can implement to build Avash Yisrael. Okay, final approach. The final approach is based on Rav Desla, and we've got three minutes left, so I think we'll be okay. Rav Desla says that generally we assume that if we love someone, we'll be inclined to give to them. However, in truth, Rav Desta tells us that it works the other way around, to say, through giving, we're able to generate love. And this is a famous idea. 
um, we know that the root of Ava is Hav, and Hav means to give in Aramaic. So we can see it even within the word Ava itself. So where do we actually see this? Where do we actually see that through giving, we're able to generate love? So Rav Desla quotes, and I'll, I'll quote it here. He quotes a passage from Masachas Derech Eretz, from, from Chazal, from the sages. He says, Let's say you want your friend to be endeared to you. What do you do? You should give for him. Involve yourself in his matters. Do what you can to help him out. Um, in fact, Rav Desla continues, and he says, we know in the Torah that there were three people who didn't have to go to war. The three people are, firstly, someone who just built a home and hasn't been able to live in it. Secondly, someone who planted a vineyard and hasn't been able to enjoy the fruits of his labor. And thirdly, someone who's just got married. Uh, or someone who's engaged but hasn't actually got married yet. And Rav Desla explains that the common feature between these three people is that they haven't, is that these people have invested time, whether it be an invested time in building a house, invested time in planting a vineyard, or invested time in building a relationship with their wife-to-be. These people who have all invested time, they've all given, and therefore we have to give them that time to allow that love, which comes about as a result of the giving, to sprout. So this is a final example. I remember, I'll say it very quickly, and then just one quick thing, thought on the parasha. Uh, I remember in yeshiva as well, there was a particular guy, he's a lovely guy, um, and he sat a few rows away from me, and he just grated on me. I don't, he was a lovely, lovely guy, but he just annoyed me. There were certain traits which really, you know, really bugged me. And... I, I told myself, you know, Josh, you have to do something about this. And he was also American, and quite loud. And it was a bit hard to sort of, you know, avoid him. And I said, Josh, you just have to do something. You have to be proactive. And I told myself, OK, I'm going to give. And that's what I did. I tried to do. I tried to give to him in any way I could. And by the end of Yeshiva, we were actually really, really close friends. He's a lovely, lovely guy. So this does actually work. I can attest to that, this idea of giving. Um, one final idea on the parasha quickly, and I know we're just at 10.30, so it's very quick. We see parasha's martyrs. Um, B'nai Gad, B'nai Ruven, and Chatsi uh, B'nai Benasha, they approach Moshe and they say, Moshe, listen, we actually don't want to live in Israel. We want to live on the other side of the Yardin, the other side of the Jordan. And Moshe is upset. Moshe is displeased. And eventually they come to an agreement. They say, uh, Moshe says, okay, that's fine, but if we go to battle, you have to lead B'nai Sol. you have to be the one leading the troops, and they agree to that. But the question is, why was Moshe so upset with them? Why was he so displeased? They had very good reasons. You know, if anything, this was an economic decision. The other side of the Yardane had great pasture, great land for their flocks. Uh, they had a nice patch of land. So why was Moshe so upset? They weren't in any way trying to cut themselves off from Klai Yisrael. But in light of what we've explained, specifically the, the understand, understanding we have of Ava from the Rambam, we can begin to understand. Moshe recognized that we're all connected. He recognized that we're all one single collective unit. And he said, if one really feels a sense of Achta Shisar, Ava Shisar, then one will feel what one feels towards one's spouse a sense of intense closeness, a sense of Choyla Sa'ava in that when they're apart from their other half, or indeed apart from the rest of the Jewish people, they feel pain, they feel sick. Moshe recognized that these two and a half tribes in approaching him to request living apart from Israel, clearly hadn't internalized this feeling enough because if they had internalized this feeling, they wouldn't have asked this. They wouldn't have been able to bear the idea of living apart from their brothers. So perhaps that's a short about how you can share around the the Shabbos table if you'd like, but that's something we see really from this idea of Alva Shisar. So I'm just going to recap quickly the three approaches. We've established that it's essential. It's the key for us to bring the Ge'ula. How do we generate it? Firstly, focus on the souls. Recognize that everyone has an Ashama HaKadosha. Recognize that our Ashama is all connected. How do we do that? Through trying as much as we can to realign our focus on our neshamas, on spiritual pursuits, 
and as much as we can and as much as realistic, um, diminish the, the focus we have on superficiality and in so doing, feel the interconnectivity we have with others. And when it's really, really tough, employ Rachmanus. Feel the pain of the other person's neshama, the other person's soul, the torture which is undergoing in its own gullus. And in so doing, generate vima'ora, this ava. Approach number two. Although we are all rooted in the same place, individuality is beautiful and valued by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And if we can value this individuality within everyone else, and a point which I didn't mention, but the the Rebbe, the first Rebbe actually mentions is, seeing as our souls are all connected and interdependent, we have to recognize that it's only through our individuality, namely the differences we have with others, that we can be mushlin, we can actually make our soul whole. Through valuing that individuality, we can build a greater sense of tolerance and indeed a greater sense of appreciation and love for others. And finally, a very practical technique, Rav Desla, give, hub. Have giving leads to love. We see this in the Gemara, and this explains many of the, the cases which we have in the Torah as well. If we give, if we invest ourselves in others, then we will begin to love them. Um, so really that's all for me. And uh, just to explain what's gonna happen next week. Uh, next week, as I said, uh, we have Dan Coleman. Dan is fantastic. He's spoken the show before. So I'd greatly encourage you all to tune in if you can. Um, and the week after that, you have me again. Um, and that, that will be the end of the three-part series. But I think that's all. If anyone has any questions um, or any comments, please feel free to, to shout out. Um, and, and if not, I think, we're, I think we're done for today. Thank you very much, Josh. Very enjoyable, very insightful. Thanks, Josh. Look forward to your next share.